Thank you, gentlemen. That was wonderful. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the Old Testament this morning, the Old Testament book of Malachi, chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Malachi, chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. Move this back just a little. <clears throat> we have been talking about stewardship. January is Stewardship Month in uh, Southern Baptist life, and we've been talking about the issue of stewardship. In the first week, we learned that it is more blessed to receive, uh, to give than to receive. More blessed to give than to receive. So we said that we were not to love money above all things. We also learned that to whom much is given, much is required. And we knew that God commands us to give in proportion to how much we have been blessed. And that all of us have been blessed extremely uh, graciously. And then last time together we, we saw that the scripture teaches that uh, how we give or how much we give or how we, we approach giving reflects how our hearts feel about the Lord, whether or not we see God as a giver or as a taker. And so this morning we're going to continue with the last sermon in this, uh, this series. This morning we're going to talk about Malachi chapter 3. Beginning in verse 8, no, because no stewardship series is complete without preaching from this passage. And in this passage, God issues us a, a dare. He dares us to test His provision for us. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Lord, we ask that we would hear your truths and that we would respond to them with joy and gladness. And Lord, that we would respond in faith, for we know that without faith it is impossible to please the Lord. Lord, take your word, apply it to our heart as a balm and a salve, that we might follow you and not sin against you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Now, I grew up with three brothers, and so uh, it, was, it was not uh, infrequent that I was dared to do something. And as the youngest, uh, quite often I would, I would be dared to do something that was either dangerous or foolish or both. And uh, uh, it's a, I'll just be honest with you, it's, it is a wonder I'm still alive today to stand here and talk to you about some of the things that I did as a kid because I was dared by my, my brothers. But we've all been dared to do something, haven't we? We've been dared to do something that was was foolish or dangerous uh, in the movie a Christmas story you, most of you have seen that movie uh, there's a scene in there one little boy is dared to stick his tongue to a flagpole in the middle of winter and of course he does it and uh, he, his tongue sticks to the flagpole and the, the scene shows the fire department come and they pull him off of the flagpole and then uh, uh, in that very next scene we see him sitting in the classroom with a with a bandage around his tongue because he, he got it stuck to the the flagpole. Uh, in our scripture this morning, God dares us to do something. He dares us, and it is, is not a dare that is dangerous, and it is definitely not foolish. Rather, God dares us in the scripture this morning that if we will give properly, that He will bless us abundantly. He promises that if we will only trust Him, if we will only step out in faith and trust Him in our giving, that He will open up the windows of heaven and He will pour out a blessing so great that we cannot contain it. The question is, are we ready to take up God's dare this morning? So let's begin by looking at the details of this dare. What's it about? Now, this is an unusual kind of dare. Uh, to be honest, when, me, when people hear the, that uh, God speaks about testing him, sometimes we could think of that in kind of a negative sense. And to be honest, there have been times in the Old Testament when God criticized Israel for testing him. In, uh, in Psalm 95, verse 8, 
He says, Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, <coughs> as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was grieved with that generation and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. So I swore my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And some people will say, Well, we should not test the Lord because He is not pleased when we test Him. The, the thing is, in the passage in Psalms, when he's talking about Israel in the wilderness, the problem was with them, they were testing His patience. God does not want us to test His patience, but He does call on us to test His promises, to test His provisions. And when God commands us to test His promises, or rather to rely on His promises, to rest in them, to, to claim His promises, if we do not, then it is sin on our part. But note here the dare that God issues is, at least from a human perspective, it's a risky dare. Now, of course, it's never risky to trust God. But from a purely human perspective, the potential costs of, of uh, trusting God, of testing Him, of accepting this dare here, uh, seems to be pretty high. Because it involves upfront faith. Upfront faith. He says, give to me first, and then I will pour out blessings on you. Now, from a human perspective, that's not a wise thing to do. You know, and, and uh, from a human perspective, you don't pay a workman before he finishes the job, do you? Uh, I actually read a, a true story. There was a, an elderly woman who uh, lived on a farm, and uh, she didn't have a, a husband at home, uh, didn't have any sons, no one to take care of the farm. And some uh, gentlemen, some men came by, and they offered to paint her barn for a really, really good price. And so she agreed. She paid them up front. And they went out and they painted the bar and they finished in record time and then they left. And then she went out to inspect the, the barn. After, after they'd left, she made her way out there to inspect the barn. She found out they only painted the side that faced the house. They hadn't painted the rest of the barn. They'd taken her money. We don't trust people with men. It's dangerous <coughs> to trust. I saw a sign in a store not long ago. It said, in God we trust, everybody else pays cash. And that's the way we approach it, don't we? Uh, with men, <laughs> we demand performance before we step out in trust. But with God, it's exactly the opposite. God calls on us to trust Him, to step out in faith, and then we receive His blessing. This is a principle we see throughout the Bible. Over and over in the Bible, God calls on us to trust and step out in faith, and then we see Him work. In uh, Joshua chapter 3, when Israel was in the wilderness, they wandered in the wilderness and they finally come to the point where they're going to enter into the promised land. And they've wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Now they're going to enter in the promised land. Joshua is going to lead them into the promised land. But they've got to cross the Jordan River. And it's springtime. Now, springtime, the Jordan River floods and it becomes a raging torrent and there's no way you're going to get across that thing. There's no way you're going to walk across the Jordan during the spring floods. But God tells His people they're to line up. They're to line up in a rank, in a file. They're, they're one long line. And He says the priests are going to be at the front and they're going to be carrying the Ark of, of uh, the, the Covenant. And He says, I want you to march into the, the Jordan River. And when you get to the Jordan River, I'll stop the waters. And so they line up, and the priests take up the Ark of the Covenant, and they start marching towards the Jordan. And they're 100 yards from the Jordan River, and it's still a raging torrent. And they're 50 yards from the Jordan River, and it's still just as swollen as it was. And they're 10 feet from the Jordan, and it still hasn't stopped up. And they go down the, the muddy bank, and the waters are still as rough as they ever were. But when they get to the river, the Bible says that when the priests put their foot in the river, the water stopped and they piled up in a heap. God's hand did not move until they stepped out in faith. That's a principle that we see over and over in the Bible. As soon as their feet touched the water, and not a moment sooner, the river stopped flowing and the waters rose up in a heap. The invisible hand of God moves 
when we step out in faith. And that's what God calls for in this dare. He says, I dare you to give. I dare you to, provide, to, to give. And I will respond by blessing and providing, but not one moment before you step out in faith. So what we need to do in prayer is determine what has God called us to give and then step out in faith. Now just a little side here. Uh, when we talk about giving, there's, there's a lot of debate, um, <coughs> a lot of ink been spilt, a lot of sermons preached on um, what it means to tithe and how much you are to give. Uh, some people will argue, well, you're supposed to give 10%. The Old Testament says you're to give 10%. Well, here's the thing. Honestly, if you add up everything that the, the Israelites were supposed to give, it adds up to more than 23%. Actually, not, not just 10%. But I'll be honest with you. If you look at the Bible, I believe there's a 10% principle that, that uh, you see throughout the Scriptures. Now, some people will say, well, Pastor, listen, the Old Testament law says we're to give 10%, but we're New Testament Christians. We're not under this Old Testament law. But here's the thing. This principle of giving 10% actually precedes the law. If you go back to Genesis chapter 14, the Bible tells us that Abraham gave 10% to Melchizedek hundreds of years before there was an Old Testament law. The Bible says that Jacob, hundreds of years before the Old Testament law, gave 10%. So I believe there's a 10% principle. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. We are under grace, not under law. And grace tends to demand more than the law did. So folks, you can give 10% and still maybe not be in God's will. You need to pray, what is God calling me to give? I think there are some principles that we need to apply when we decide how much God wants us to give. The first is, we are to give regularly. Not just once in a while, not just when we think about it. We should give regularly. It should be a part of our budget. It should be the first item on your budget. We're to give cheerfully. The Bible said God loveth a cheerful giver. We should give gladly. Hilariously is what the Greek means. We should laugh as we give. Hilariously, cheerfully giving to God. And finally, we are to give sacrificially. It should hurt a little bit. If we're giving what we should, it should be sacrificial on our part. If you're doing these things, then you're being obedient. Now part of this means that if you're, if you're giving sacrificially, <coughs> you're going to be giving off the top. And that means you're going to step out in faith. Don't wait until the end of the month to see if you got anything left. Because I know a lot of people that try to do that. They'll say, well, Pastor, I'll wait at the end of the month. If i got anything left at the end of the month, I'll give. You know something? You won't have anything at the end of the month. It just always works that way. Folks, if you, if you operate like that, you'll never give. Not on a regular basis. In the Old Testament, they were taught the principle of the first fruits. You gave the first fruits of your produce. Why the first fruits? Because by giving the very first, you were saying, I have faith that more is going to come. It was an act of faith on their part. And that should be the way it is with tithing. We give first, expecting that God will provide later. 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says that we are to give as God prospers us. Remember the principle we gave you a few weeks ago. To whom much is given, much is required. But whatever you give, it needs to come off the top. The tithes should be the first item out of your budget. But pastor, that's risky. That's risky, isn't it? From a human perspective, it's risky. There was a man who came to a preacher. Uh, I was reading about this preacher. He had a, a church member came to him and said, Pastor, you want me to give? Uh, you want to get off top? I said, but, but what if I get to the end of the month and I don't have enough left? What if that happens? What do I do? The pastor said, well, I'll tell you what. If I promise you that I will personally, out of my own pocket, make up any deficit you have at the end of the month, would you give? And he said, well, I guess I, guess I would. The pastor said, well, here's the thing. What you're telling me is that you trust a poor pastor to have enough to pay your shortfall, but you don't trust the God of the universe. Folks, God requires us to give up front because it's an act of faith. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. In Malachi, the people are complaining because they don't want to give because their, their crops have not been great. And God says, yeah, but you got it backwards. If you'll step out in faith and give, then 
I'll make sure you have enough. Not bless me and I'll give, but give and I'll respond with blessing. Secondly, there are instructions. <coughs> instructions about this dare. See, dares always have a condition. Um, <coughs> you have to meet certain conditions. Um, I remember when, uh, when I was a little boy, my brothers would, would dare us to do something. I remember one of the dares that I, I, I was uh, uh, manipulated into was to swim across the lake where my, my grandmother lived, swim across the lake and touch a certain rock and then come back. And I remember I swam across the lake and I came back almost drowned halfway back because I mean it was, it was a long, long, long haul. I finally made it back. And you know something? I didn't win because I didn't touch the right rock. <laughs> Dares always have a condition, you know. Touch the rock, touch the right rock when you get to the, the other side. Well, what are God's conditions here? Well, first of all, we have to adopt God's priorities. Christ's priority is His church. Christ gave His life for the church. One day He's coming back for His church, His bride, and it is a priority to Jesus Christ. And likewise, the church should be a priority for us. It should be a priority in our lives. Uh, I recognize the, uh, there's, a, there's a truth. The vast majority of people in church walk out the doors on Sunday afternoon and never think about the church again till they come back the next week. But it shouldn't be that way. Church is a priority to God. It should be a priority to us. The relationships you have in this church will last for eternity. You may not be able to say that about family. You certainly can't, can't say that about work. And so we need to make church a priority because it is Christ's priority. Is anything important going on here at Younger's Creek Baptist Church? Yes, it is. Then it needs to be a priority for us. We also should have God's perspective on money. God says, if you want my blessing, He says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. You know what the problem with Israel was? It wasn't that they didn't give anything at all. Their problem was that they were not tithers, they were tippers. They gave either excess. They had a little bit left over, and so they gave whatever they had that was left over. They didn't give the whole tithe. Now, the last time we were together, we, we talked about how their perspective was uh, how little can we give to God. Their, their view was God as a taker. So their, their perspective was how, can, how little can I get away with giving? But if you see God as a giver, your perspective is different. Your perspective is how much can I get away with giving? In Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells us the parable of the unjust steward who has been fired by his master. And the Bible says that in order to court favor with his master's debtors, he forgave part of their debts. In other words, he considered the favor of these people more important than the money. And the same is true in our life. God's favor is more important than money. Luke 16.10 says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in, must, in, in much. The thing that is least in that verse is money. And the thing that is most important is the eternal riches that God has promised us. The favor of God Almighty. The point is, you will, you will never give as long as you view money like the world does, that it's the most important thing. But you'll give generously if you have God's perspective, that God's priorities, that money is not the most important thing, but God's favor is the most important thing. We also need to have God's timing. Notice what Malachi says here about the timing of these tithes. He says in verse 10, Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. Present tense. Don't wait till you're out of debt. Don't wait till the crops get better. Don't wait until, until the kids are grown. If you, if you wait until, you, until things get better, until things are, are, are ready, there may not be a church around here anymore. If you, if you, want, to get, if you want to give, give now. Give now. 
Give now. If you're, out, if you're in debt, make a plan to get out of debt. But make sure that plan includes giving. Otherwise, God won't bless that plan. I read about a, a, a church in southern Asia. And uh, it was made up of several hundred people in this little village on an island in southern Asia. The people there made 20 cents a week, on average, 20 cents a week plus rice. That's all they made. Everyone in the church at least tithed. At least. And by the way, did I mention they were all lepers? Why'd they do that? Because they had God's priorities. They saw God's favor as more important than money. We wrongly think that one day we're going to have enough to give. But God says, give now out of what you have, and I will bless you. I will bless you. So what's the reward of accepting God's dare? Well, the reward is abundant blessing. Look at verse 10 again. <coughs> Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, some of you read that, and you're thinking right now, well, that's great. If I give, then God's going to make me rich. I've always wanted to be rich. Here's the thing. God never promises that you're going to be rich. Now, the truth is, if you're in America, from a worldwide perspective, you're already rich. If you're an American, uh, even our poor people, by world standards, are wealthy. Okay? But I'm not promising you that if you will give, that you're going to be rich by American standards. No, because God doesn't promise us wealth. No matter what Joel Osteen or Kenneth Copeland may tell you, God does not promise that you're going to be wealthy. Rather, He makes three promises, none of which are wealth. First of all, He promises you adequate provision. Verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. What he's promising here is not that he will make you rich, but that he will provide for your needs. God knows what you need. And quite honestly, wealth might be the worst thing for you. you know, I'm convinced the reason I'm not rich is because God knows it will ruin me. So he will not give you something that's going to ruin you. But he has promised he will meet your needs. And what he promises Israel here is that the harvest will come in like it's supposed to. When you plant your garden, the garden will bear fruit. You'll have what you need. I'll provide for your needs. Verse 12, he promises them a fruitful ministry. Verse 12, and all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. All nations will call you blessed. When you give, the nations will hear about Christ, and they will call you blessed. You will literally be storing up treasure for yourself in heaven in the form of a harvest of souls. You will have a fruitful ministry that honors God. And He promises us delight which I think flows from that other thing here. If we have a fruitful ministry for Christ, we will experience delight. He says, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. That means that the, the sins that come from greed are going to be diminished. The gospel is going to be shared. Needs are going to be met. You're going to be useful for the Lord. You're going to accomplish things for the kingdom. And what could bring you more joy and more delight than that? I don't know about you, but I want to be useful. I want to make a difference in the world. I want to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Um, there's a mo movie in 1992 called Lorenzo's Oil. I don't know if any of you ever saw it. It's kind of a, kind of a small movie. It had a wonderful, wonderful premise in it. <clears throat> Uh, true story is about a man named uh, Augusto Odone, and he had a son named Lorenzo, Lorenzo who came down with a very rare disease, a very rare condition. And so his father set out to try to come up with a cure for his son, and he came up with an idea for a certain kind of oil that he could use, that his son could consume, that would, that would uh, uh, stop the progression of his disease. The only problem was he needed a chemist that would help him develop this oil. And so he, he went around trying to find somebody 
that was a chemist that would help him. And he found uh, this one guy uh, who was, uh, his name was uh, Don uh, Scudaby. Don Scudaby worked for a cosmetics company. And he, he pitched him this idea for, for coming up with this oil that would stop the progression of this disease. And Scudaby said he would, he would be a part of this. He would do this. And there's a wonderful scene in that movie where all the people that work with him are looking through a window into the lab and he's in there working feverishly, Scudaby's in there working feverishly on, on this, this oil and somebody looks at another one, person standing there and says, uh, says he, he, he hadn't stopped working for days. He hadn't slept, he hadn't ate. This is all he's doing. And somebody else said, the man spent his whole life making lipstick. This is one chance to make a difference. Folks, we all want to make a difference, don't we? We want to make a difference for the kingdom of God. If we'll take God's dare and we will step out in faith and we will give, we can make a difference for the kingdom of God. I read something just this week about George Mueller, who was a man that took God's dare. Back in the 19th century, he opened an orphanage. Now, he never made the financial needs of the orphanage public to anybody except God. In his prayer life, he'd lift up the needs to God, and God always provided, often miraculously, for the needs of that orphanage. And one of the reasons God provided was that George Mueller gave 86% of everything he received to the Lord. Uh, over his lifetime, he literally gave away millions and died penniless. But he gave away millions. As a matter of fact, from uh, 1870 until 1885, he personally paid the salaries for 33 missionaries in China. Completely supported them out of his own pocket. God did that. Because this was a man who delighted in God who delighted in God's work. And he had a delightful life because he gave and he trusted in God. How about you this morning? Are you going to trust in God enough to take God's dare this year? Are you going to go trust God enough to make a commitment to give regularly, to give cheerfully, and to give sacrificially to the support of of God's work. Maybe you're here this morning, you're not a believer in Christ. You don't know Christ as your Savior. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. All of us have sinned. Every one of us, the Bible said, is a children, or we, are, we are a child of wrath by nature. But God has loved us so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. God desires that you have everlasting life. Folks, we talk about giving. Truth is, we can't outgive God because He's already given us so much. He's given us heaven and eternal life and the payment for our sins that we could have never purchased by ourselves. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior, the first thing you need to do is you need to enter into a relationship with Jesus. In just a moment, I'm going to be standing here at the front. We're going to sing a hymn. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, I'm going to invite you to step out in the aisle. Come to the front and say, Pastor, I need to know that's Jesus you've been talking about. I need to know Him as my Lord and my Savior. If you're a believer in Christ... Maybe you have not been trusting God. You have not taken God's uh, dare. You've not stepped out in faith. You have been that person who said, you know, I'll give as soon as I get out of debt. I'll give when things get better. It's not the way it works. God says, trust me up front, and then I'll bless you. Maybe in this, this, during this time of invitation, you need to make that commitment today. Let's be obedient to God. Whatever He's calling us to do this morning. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and care about us and that you have provided for our needs. We thank you, Lord, that we can't outgive you. We ask, Lord, that everyone who's under the hearing of, of my voice this morning, that, Lord, they will know Christ as their Savior. If there's someone that doesn't know Christ, we ask that you would move upon their heart, convict them of their sin and their need for a Savior and the truth of the gospel. Lord, for those who are believers in Christ, we ask, Lord, that we would dedicate ourselves to following you in faith. That we would step out and honor you with our, with, uh, our time, our talents, our treasure, our temple, our truth, our testimony.
And Lord, we ask that we would honor you with everything that you've entrusted to us, including our money. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen.